uh, uh, for many years. Currently, he's an online instructor at, at the University of Guelph in Ontario. His presentation today, as you see by the agenda, is uh, the hockey photos of famed photographer Alan Rickerby. 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 Yes, and, and, and Dave's going to, you know, I, I talked to him earlier, well, how did you get into this? Well, he, he was all set to tell me. But he's going to tell you the story on how, <laughs> how he uh, uh, developed a passion for this collection uh, of photos, and he's pleased to share them with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am pleased to share it with you. I'm thrilled to be here. You know, I, I'm an ecologist. So I've been part of several professional international societies. Society of Ecological Restoration, International Society of Arboriculture. Culture. But to get an invite to the Society for International Hockey Research, that's like, that's just a wonderful thing. I'm sure there's others in the room who understand that completely. So. Uh, as much as I love my line of work, um, I think we all, most of us, probably all of us can agree that uh, there's something about this way this passion touched us as children and uh, carried it forward. And so that's my long-winded way of saying uh, thanks for the invite. Um, what I plan to do is tell you a bit about Arthur Rickerby and a bit about myself and then a bit about how Arthur Rickerby and I have in one form or another across the past now. Um, Arthur Rickerby was born in Manhattan, but raised in the Bronx. His father died when he was just a toddler, and his strongest memory of his mother is that she worked all the time. So that was uh, Arthur's start. In high school, he was failing a biology class and he noticed that the teacher of that class also ran a camera club. So we decided that he would join the camera club in an effort to win favor with the teacher who held his high school outcome in his hand. Little did he know, I mean, it was one of those moments when life changed for him, and he, he uh, fell in love with photography. Now, what I want to say before I go any further is this. Um, I'm not an expert in any of these things I'm talking about today. I'm going to talk about photography, I'm going to talk about the collector's industry, the, the collector hobby, I'm going to talk about hockey, I'm going to talk about writing. I mean, there's better writers in this room than I am, people far more experienced than I have. Um, having said that, what I am an expert on is finding my way to, on this journey to where that I'm, I'm sharing with you today. So uh, I don't say that so much to cover my butt about any errors I might make, it's just that if if I do make errors, and someone in the room knows those errors, feel, feel free to tell me, if not here, then in break time or something. Because the way I learn is I immerse myself in a process, and then I just take that ball and run with it. And that's a big part of what I'm trying to share with you today, is my process. So um, Arthur, when he left high school, he went to Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, I believe. And he quickly, he started, he was studying political science. And what he quickly figured out was, if he took photographs of varsity sports, he could sell them to the local newspapers. And he did that, and helped to fund his way through university. When the university ended for him, he was born in 1921, I don't know if I said that, so you can kind of get a picture of where he's at, where he's in university, and, and when. So when university ended for him, he enlisted in World War II. And some clever, I believe, some clever recruiter recognized his talents with a camera and put him into a unit where he was led by a captain named Edward Steichen. Now, many of these words, of course, I've only seen in print, so I might be pronouncing them wrong, and someone might know more about Edward Steichen's history than I do. But Ed, Edward was born in 1879. So that means when he enlisted in World War II, he was my age. I'm going to be 60 in September. So, but he was a famed painter and photographer. So the first, so Arthur's duties throughout the war was photographing World War II. He photographed uh, burials at sea, um, airstrikes on Tokyo, invasions, Iwo Jima, for example. I don't know if I said that one right here, but Okinawa. But um, it was his job to photograph those things. 
he went in as a lieutenant, by the time he came out, he was a captain. And he was, like so many young men of that era, I'm sure, at that time, had to decide what the post-war world was going to look like to him. So he started freelancing for some of America's most notable news agencies. Uh, Life magazine hired him to be official photographer of the Kennedy administration. He was actually in the motorcade, Dallas motorcade, when JFK lost his life. He was in a different automobile, but he was photographing the events of the day. He, um, he, he, he um, was the photographer of note when um, Don Larson pitched his perfect game in the World Series. And I believe that's the only perfect game ever in the World Series. He was there for that. The famous photograph of, of the last pitch and the scoreboards directly behind him, and you can see the line. So um, he photographed Marilyn, um, Jimmy Hoffa, the Queen, when she came to Canada, he came up, uh, things like that. He, he was uh, quite a talent and having quite a successful uh, freelance career to a point where he was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Now, think about this for a second, please, and you get a kind of, I think you get a clear idea on why he was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. He helped to pioneer the 35 millimeter camera. He helped to pioneer their new zoom lenses. He helped to pioneer machine drives, capacity to take several, several photographs per second. At the time, the idea of photographing three photographs per second was, was unheard of. Today we have cameras that can take um, 50 trillion photographs per second. But, but uh, Arthur was trying a machine drive for the first time, and he was pioneering the use of color film. And where did he decide to do that? He asked Life Magazine, could they send him to dark, old arenas to photograph fast athletes? <laughs> so he was pretty courageous and pretty bold. And that's what he did. He started photographing hockey players um, with the intention of putting together photo essays in the late, no, no, in the, in the mid-50s until the early 70s. And he died, 51 years of age, pancreatitis, August 1972 months before the Summit Series. So at the same time that Arthur passed away, his photo collection, which was sitting with Life Magazine, Life Magazine went into insolvency. And his photos started to just disappear. People, I can, in my head, I can picture people walking out of work with a box of his hockey images. But everything started to disappear. The only thing that really survived as a body of work was in his wife Wanda's basement, his basement, but his, but his widow's basement. And uh, she sold them, uh, the whole unit of them, to a fellow in Little Rock, Arkansas, who's kept them safe ever since. But um, <coughs> he, had, he had three boys and Wanda. And uh, a couple of things about Arthur at that time. Um, he, was, he was an advocate for women, women's rights and he believed in women in sports. And um, he believed, in, and so for all the photographs he started taking on university campuses, he started uh, photographing the women's teams as well. And he started matching it, even though the newspapers were telling him they didn't want those photographs, he continued to match them. Now, there's been suggestions that like any young man in university had ulterior motives. <laughs> but he actually carried that, carried that message on through, uh, through his entire body of work. Um, the other thing he was uh, in, in the 60s and 70s was an environmentalist. And being an environmentalist was seen as bordering on insanity. So he took a, he took a, lot, of, he took a lot of crap for that, that part of his life, but he continued to. So he was quite a progressive thinker in many, many ways. Um, what happened is when his body work went missing, or when his body work started to disappear, it wasn't until largely the advent of the internet until it started to reappear. You can imagine, right, um, on eBay, for example. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so that's Arthur Rickerby. These are some of his images right here. They're not 
perfect. They're not magazine quality, a lot of them. These are his seconds and his rejects, okay? Um, what, what often happens, I've heard photographers say, is when you die, your best photos right away go for sale. And then somebody goes, oh, well, let's try and sell the seconds. And then when they're all gone, you say, well, let's try to get rid of the region. So, so what happened is, oh, what just happened there? Time out? Just touch something? Thanks, Albert. So, um, so let me tell you for a second here. My first hockey memory is May third, nineteen seventy. Um, game one, Stanley Cup final, St. Louis, Boston. Um, I was a little late coming to the game. I was almost twelve years old, but uh, there was nobody in my family interested in it. I don't think they were trying to keep it from me even though they probably didn't know they would have to give up the television set every Saturday night and more for the next, for the next decade, probably close to it each year. But um, I came to it rather late, but I saw that game. Stanfield fired a shot from the point. Esposito deflected it upwards. It hit Plant in the mask. Glenn Hall had to finish the series. And um, seven days later, Bobby's iconic Superman flying goal to score. And I was hooked. Absolutely, and uh, it's been part of my life ever since. Just like I'm sure it has, the majority, if not all, of the people in this room. So, what happened is, um, I went off to university, studied something responsible. Um, I've made my living at it, taught for 28 years, and I decided I wanted to write full time. So, I quit a full time faculty position at a Canadian college, four years short of early retirement. Um, this is a bit indulgent, but I figure I gave up more than a million dollars in earnings over the final decade of my work life. That's how badly I wanted it. And I went and I bought a $10,000 house in Newfoundland, $150 a year municipal taxes. I had to crawl from under an Ontario mortgage before I could free myself up from work of any kind. And um, paid work. I continued to teach uh, online for the University of Guelph. I did that from this tiny little outport in Newfoundland. 90 minute boat ride and a three hour drive from the Trans Canada Highway. And I wrote uh, The Last Ten Point Night, a uh, hockey book about my childhood hero, Jim Harrison. And um, I went and found him in British Columbia, and we made a connection, and I wrote about that experience. Um, I like to think that there's, um, in my own simple little world, that there's two kinds of writers. There's some who want to be well received and critically acclaimed, and there's some who want to make money. And whatever side you go in on, you wish you were on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no doubt in my mind what side I went in on. I wanted my art to be well received, I wanted it to be respected, I wanted it to be valued. And uh, it's like uh, in songwriting, they say, like Fred Eaglesmith, probably. Many people in this room don't even know who he is, but he's a singer-songwriter who lots of people want to record his songs, but he'd like to make some money. And then John Bon Jovi, they call him a hair, they refer to him as a hair band, right? And he wants more respect for his writing, but he had enough money to put a bid in on the Buffalo Bills. So I, I, I'm thrilled for everything that's come from this book, but um, it's got a very small audience of followers, and uh, I appreciate those who have appreciated me, who have approached me today and told me that, that they've read it and uh, even asked me to sign it. So I can't tell you enough how, how big this has been in my life, how important this has been. And I wouldn't be standing here today, I suspect, well, I'm sure, without this book. So I also wrote a book about Newfoundland about five years in this isolated outport that just came out uh, about four weeks ago. And, um, and then I fell in love with an Ontario woman with two little kids, and I came back to Ontario. So, um, I, I reached a point with my writing where I decided I wanted to develop more as a visual and a digital writer. And I concluded the way to do that was I had to create some compelling content. I had to find some, I had to create and find some compelling content. I can write a blog all I want, but if it's not going to draw readers, 
not reaching an audience and that's not going to work for me. So I started thinking, well, how can I create compelling content? And I went searching on eBay for photo images because what I've learned is on Facebook, when I post one of my dad's, my late father's 35 millimeter slides, I get it digitized and I post it and I tag it with about 125 words, it gets a lot of attention and it seems to make a lot of people happy. I think it's nostalgia among other things. So I started looking at, at images for sale on eBay. And I came across a, a fellow in uh, the town of Paradise, Newfoundland, of all places, and he was selling up 101 slides. He was selling them individually. And um, they didn't look like they were moving too fast. So I wrote to him and asked him if I bought all 101, could he cut me a deal? And he did, he cut me a significant deal. And if anybody ever wants to talk numbers, I'm glad to do that as well. <coughs> so I'm going to circulate one. It's not that you haven't seen 35 millimeter slides before, but what happens with these slides is the, the cardboard frame on them picks up all kinds of stuff. You know, it picks up what I think <coughs> is Art Rickerby's handwriting. It picks up a stamp. It picks up all kinds of information that the, the magazine or the source. You know, it says hockey best on it. I don't know what that means. Perhaps you do. Um, it's got Glenn Hall and he's bobbling a puck. And he's got his head turned to the camera. So again, it's nothing that, that would have necessarily made it to the front page of Sports Illustrated. But it's, um, it's got tape on two sides. And I've since learned that they call that uh, surgical repairs. Because they had to, at that time, take the, take the positive negative out and, and uh, use it. And then put it back into the cardboard frame. So I found these 101, and I, I, I sent him with my money, and he wrote back and said, to be honest with you, I've got 305 more. <laughs> so I sucker when he, he sucker when he saw one. So I thought about it for about 15 minutes and said, yeah, 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 let's do it. And uh, so, and I've been since filling in that collection to the point where I think I have 610 right now. And uh, I post them once a week, and I've been doing that since the second week of January. I did that whole transaction on New Year's Eve. So 2018 was set up for me in a really big way. And um, I've been uh, um, once a week posting them, and I write 125 words with them. And I haven't advertised beyond two, two little things. <coughs> One is, I don't mean that. I don't mean to make it sound it, it, he was, he was, he's been great about it. But one of them is, I put it out once to my almost 600 Facebook friend list. And Greg was kind enough to write a story about me and my effort in your, in your publication in his column, Two Minutes for Reading So Good. So that's been the only advertising I've done. Because my intent <coughs> is to do a six month run. I'll have 26 images up so when somebody signs on, they don't just see a few images. They'll see 26 to be able to scroll through them. And I wanted to see what's working and what's not working. Do I want the like button? Do I not want the like button? Do I want to interact with viewers? Do I not want to? And what I found is, um, it's a work, it continues to be a work in progress. And what I found is, um, uh, viewers have ranged from zero per day, zero views per day, to 45 views per day. And they've come from 11 countries. And those 11 countries are US, Canada, Russia, Germany, Sweden, Australia, South Korea, Latvia, Great Britain, Ireland, France. And we're at about the 20 week mark. I've got about 20 images loaded. And um, soon I'm about to start trying to get the word out a little stronger, try to advertise it. I won't lie to you. That's, I'm indirectly asking you to do the same. So uh, all I mean is please visit it, ArthurRickerby.net. And uh, if you haven't already. Um, so what I've done is I've decided that I'm part Part curator, part collector, part writer. What 
what I, the, re the really big reason I wanted to create this is because I wanted to draw readers. I wanted to use it as a chance to promote myself, continue to promote myself as a Canadian author, but also to just raise my profile and hopefully indirectly sell my books. You know, because because that just seems to be such a big part of what we have to do now, right? It's, it's play such a large role in helping to sell our own books. So that was that was the intention, and uh, I brought it in. So what I do is I attach um, 125 words of my own writing in my own style. Anybody who's read uh, the last 10.9 will know my style is slightly different, and uh, I have uh, postgrad studies in expressive arts. You can, even in the way I talk to you right now, that's my voice. I just learned how to put my spoken voice down on the page. I didn't know any other way to write. And uh, what I'd like to do, and then I'll, I'll close, close my part off here and open the floor to questions, is I would like to just show you the one image. And, um, and uh, show you what I, uh, and read to you what I've written below it. So again. Okay, two short paragraphs. I appreciate the beauty of imperfection. I like a rusty truck more than I do a shiny car. And I feel more appeal for the big messy tree smothering in my shaky garden shed than I do my neighbor's impeccable lawn. I'm not sure why this is, but I believe it's about more than aesthetics. That it's a much needed reminder for me that nothing is perfect or permanent. Like this photo of Johnny Bauer, Eddie Schaaf, and Marcel Pronovo, circa 1967. Two of these men have previously passed away, and this image's haziness helps me to experience that loss. With only Eddie remaining, it seems appropriate that he assumed the front and center position in this picture while his friends fade away. And then, I slip in a little link to my book, and that's pretty much everything that this site entails. So thanks a lot for letting me share my story, and uh, I'm thrilled to be part of it. I heard you call it Sir. Is that what you call it? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, it's good to know. Society for International Hockey Research, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here today. So thanks very much. I probably should have fielded questions first because I set myself up for two applause. Well, that, that's the idea. That's, you know, <laughs> that's, what, that's what professors do. Okay. Thanks. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. They're running yeah. lots of questions. Mark Wayne is uh, reported to have said that he wrote a letter to someone, and he said, I wrote you a long letter because I didn't have time to write you a short letter. <laughs> and I was thinking about that as, as you talked about the narrative you put in the picture. How did you choose 125 words, and do you write a lot more? and, and Crafted down. How, how do you go about doing that? And kind of why? How did you write that? Down? Yeah. Thanks for asking. Aubrey. Yeah. Absolutely. I write more. You know. Uh, and and then start chopping away, chopping away, chopping away. Basically, I came to the conclusion that uh, two paragraphs. Somebody's come to look at an image. I don't want to try to hold them for too long. I don't think I can, and I don't think I will. So I decided it's just turned out with trial and error. Two paragraphs worked for me, and I hope it would work for the reader. But as far as what you asked, well, what Mark Twain said, absolutely, is uh, you know it doesn't make me uh, unique, but uh, that's what so many of us have to do is write so much and then chip it down, chip it down. I mean, a forty-five thousand word book that was probably almost double that size when it started. And um, the only thing I'll add is it's hard to get your head around because we live in a culture where big is better and it's celebrated. And then I have this little book, and it gets lost on the shelves of chapters and things like that. So they put these little sleeves on, and they tell me, and I tell them I don't like them. And then they say, well, chapters just placed a big order, and we don't want to get it lost on the shelf. And suddenly, because there's money on the line, it changed my whole philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> I think these things are a great idea. But um, so, so that's a long way to answer your question, Aubrey. But I just, I just, I start large, and then I start chipping away at it and try to produce what I consider. Thanks for asking. There's. Uh, if you want to do that job, sorry. No, no, no. You're going fine. Go ahead. Yeah, there's a, an opportunity. The our organization has got an exchange of memberships. 
with the Photographic Historical Society of Canada. And what they have is presentations, speakers that come in and talk about uh, photographic methods and photographic collections, and that's usually in the Toronto area about uh, three to six times a year. So you might look at that as being another opportunity to, to talk about your subject in Arthur uh, Rickaby's methods. Yeah, I might. Thanks. That's that's wonderful news. Thanks for that. You and I are best friends now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. That's a that's a wonderful contribution. Just a curiosity: the content of the the players who are involved here are they all NHL players or are there some minor leagues? Uh, they're all NHL. But I, when I say that, I shouldn't say that quite so quickly. Um, listening to Dennis talk this morning, I'm reminded how there's so many names I see in uh, print. And um, I don't always pronounce them correctly, but uh, in Arts' collection, you never know what you're going to get sometimes. You, you buy a box sight unseen. So um, there's one here. Actually, there's many, but there's one that represents. And most of them are from 1967-68. Uh, some I've put in. Arthur took them up till, till he passed away in, in uh, 70, 72. But, um, some of them, he was at uh, in Grenoble at the 68 Winter Olympics. So here's one nobody wanted to buy. And yet, it didn't take much to figure out that that's Lou Nanny in the USA uniform, perhaps the greatest collegiate hockey, arguably the greatest collegiate hockey player ever. And uh, how do you say it? And Natalie Fierce? I don't know how. And, and totally first time? Fierce. 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 But you know, so depending on what part of the world you come from, some would argue that it's the greatest hockey player ever. He's 149 pounds. And again, but there's no numbers or anything like that, so I've been piecing together images from a Google search. The goalie's name is Jim Rogue. It's in France, in the Ice Palace, and the, in 1968, that's pretty progressive, pretty pretty cutting edge in that the boards were clear plexiglass. So we saw that a short time later in WHA, I believe. But uh, so, so the answer question is they're almost all NHL. They're almost all... 65 to 69. I think that shot of Esposito and Sanderson in the dressing room might be 70. But I like my goalies maskless. And um, so I'm so I try and just, and plus I'm trying to keep my collecting from getting too unruly. And it's mostly been NHL players, original six. And I'm only going to post original six and the occasional international. That's my plan. So great. Thanks for asking. This is just additional information. Yes, I can relate to this. I was at Grenoble in 1968. This was a disaster for the United States. Yes, we lost ten to two. <laughs> yes, Natty was co-captain with Herb Brooks. Just yeah. add to your body of knowledge. Yes, please. <laughs> and you know, just, that's very interesting because there's maybe a dozen, maybe twelve or fifteen slides, and they're all the Russians congratulating each other. After a goal, right? Well, I have a lot to congratulate. <laughs> yeah. And so I did. I did look it up, and I think it was 10-2 or something. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, so, yeah, pretty incredible. So, but and I'd forgotten the Herb Brooks connection. So, thank you. Just to show you what a small world it is. The, my centerman, my senior in high school. Yes. Was on that team. And uh, honestly, after he went off to college. Yes. I, I never saw him again. I heard he died recently, but he was on that team of those guys. Yes. And there's a photo, not of him. Right. But his name was. But I might have a photo of him, right? Uh, probably not, but I'll tell you his name when yes. we're done here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. Great. Because that's what that's what crosses my mind. Well, or let me just let me just blur it out here because he ended up living in Framingham. Doug Vollmer, who's an all American at Michigan State. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sixty eight Olympics he played seven years of professional hockey, but sixty NHL games. But this was back when you know, an American busting into the league was not that easy to no, do. No, of course and not. He, yeah, I tell you what, I went off to college and played one year, and I was not nearly as good as I was when he was my centerman. Fair enough. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Fair enough. That's great. Thank you. He died in December. Yeah. yeah. And I'm finding, of course, digging through these, many of these men have passed on. So, there, there are also. Uh, a disproportionate amount of archives uh, at Rochester American because Rochester was the home of Eastman Kodak 
and they were experimenting with high-speed films with new color film chemistry. Yeah, and sure. whenever they wanted to shoot anything with speed or, or light, uh, invariably they'd go down to the rink. So there's, there's just an incredible collection of, uh, it's, it's difficult to find, but yes. through, through Eastman Kodak, there are some archives, but uh, if you ever wondered why, how come there's so many, it's not just because they were the darlings of the AHL, but yes, yes, yes. Kodak was right there on their doorstep. So two things I'd like to say to that. Thank you. One of them is there's a new film on Netflix right now with Ed Harris called Kodachrome, and it, and it's and you helped fill in some blanks that I took from that story. Yeah. And and um, the other thing is um, Arthur's photographs, Arthur's image, certainly the ones I've been able to access. There's a disproportionate amount of Bruins photos, and for a guy who who grew up in New York, there's very few range of images, and I don't know why that. Is or was, but but uh, I thanks for that additional information. So, yeah. Anybody else? All right. Thanks again.